John, you know I've uh, greatly appreciated your uh, writings over the years. I've uh, I've looked to you as uh, something of a, of a mentor as you've helped me expand my uh, my horizons and way to think about uh, 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 ultimate reality. Uh, I've struggled with theism, um, but you, you you've shown me a bigger a bigger world that uh, perhaps theism is embedded within. Uh, uh, how can I begin to understand the uh, alternative concepts of God uh, or the, the, um, the different ways in which uh, a transcendent reality uh, might be manifest? Well, I, I think you're saying what are the alternatives to the Christian gods? Yeah, and but keeping a sense of the transcendent. I know the alternative of naturalism. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, but I, I've always had the sense that, although I've studied science a great deal, that uh, maybe there's more to to reality than the naturalism can uh, can access. Uh, I'm not sure of that. Uh, I want to understand what what is beyond naturalism. What's the world beyond naturalism? Well, uh, I think we could then. S- define God for our purposes as going beyond what science tells us about. And one way of going beyond it is to say that there's a personal creator behind everything. Another is saying that science describes the pattern of the world and God somehow underlies that pattern. Another is saying that the explanatory factor is something very abstract. In Thomas Aquinas, you have the idea that God is pure being. And it's not clear, therefore, that God really exists. God might be some sort of force. And you could think that God is the most important thing in the universe. Without being a personal being. It, it's very hard to s- tie anybody down in this field. Mm. Everything gets so abstract. <laughs> All right, let, 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 let's consider those possibilities. I, is there a way to categorize them? If we, if we say the big category are things that science cannot explain. Uh, and so one big category are things science can't explain. And, and we're not saying that it's real or not, but want to explore the category. So in that category, is it fair to say that maybe we split it from pers- a personal being and a non-personal being? Is that... That would be one way of cutting it, yes. Okay. But um, there's also the question of whether God is a being at all, whether God is somehow beyond existence or whether God is pure being in such a way that our normal concepts of a being just don't apply, Mm. which is the view you found in Aquinas and Mm. is still defended by many Catholics. And and what does that mean? That means that that we can't understand it or we can understand it, but none of our categories apply. It's it's too too, too different of you. I think that... We can't understand it, would be the answer that somebody like Aquinas would give. Mm. But at the same time, we can get an idea of what's going on with the help of analogies. God is in some way loving. God is in some way highly intelligent. God is able to act in the way in which a good person could act. Those are the sorts of analogies which some people would use even when they use a very abstract concept of God. But those sound very personal. Well, they do sound very personal, but when the people who are developing them say all the time, remember, this isn't a person. (laughs) (laughs) So so what would be the difference between those characteristics being uh, instantiated or as, as part of a person versus a, a non-personal ground of being or force or something. How, 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 how would we differentiate? It sounds like a distinction without a difference. Well, you could go all the way back to Plato and say that 
what is producing the universe is a force of value, and the force of value produces the best, and it's producing the best in the way in which somebody who knew what was best would be producing the best. And it's being good in the way in which somebody who wanted to be good would, e would e be good. Even but though in that case there's no person involved. Even though no person is involved. Yeah, so that sounds like a personal attitude without a person. That sounds a little strange. It, it's a factor producing things which a good and wise, knowledgeable person would produce without being a person at all. Mm. That's how that tradition looks on God. So of these characteristics of God in which it is non-personal at this point, um, we have Plato's value and good that you're just saying now. We have this pure being. I know that's, that's Islamic, uh, the idea of God being beyond being or something like that. Uh, and how does the Catholic go? Well, the Catholic saint of theology, so to speak, is Thomas Aquinas. Yes. And he is known for the idea that all God's characteristics are really one and the same as the characteristic of existing. Mm. And that in the end, God only has the characteristic of existing as his most basic characteristic. And all the others are, in some way, unified in that. It is a very mysterious doctrine. The, 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 God's simplicity, which simplicity is very mysterious. It may, it may sound simple, but it... It, 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 sort of... it sounds at first sight absurd to say that uh, power can be the same thing as goodness, can be the same thing as knowledge. Mm. But that's, that's what's said, and that's what a lot of people still believe. And in that case, uh, existence then it becomes the, 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 the highest... Quality of, of that drives it, or, or they're all mixed together in one. Well, I think the official Catholic view, insofar as they follow Thomas Aquinas, would be that God is pure being, and that in those parts of the Bible where he's shown as saying my name is I am, yeah. that is giving us some insight into the nature of God. Mm. I, I don't myself, uh, I'm not a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> and I, the only way I can make sense of that doctrine is in fact related to, to that of Plato. Mm. And it's not clear to what extent uh, Thomas Aquinas is following Plato. He, mm. he may have his own ideas. Mm. This guy should have lived longer. He died at 50, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what a pity he didn't have yeah. more chance to develop yeah. this sword. Yeah. 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 So, so, okay, we, so we have these, um, these concepts of God as, 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 as being, as, uh, as a force. Uh, um, now, w w what, what about the, um, the, 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 those doctrines of, of God where God is... Is synonymous with the universe in some way. Um, pantheism, panentheism. Uh, how do those articulate? Well, I, I think it's not enough just to say that God is the universe, because then you're back with science. Mm -hmm. uh, God is the universe, typically seen as in some way unified. Uh, everything is an aspect of God, and this is a typical view of the pantheists. Just as the redness of this chair and the length of the chair and the weight, these are all unified in the chair, so you and I and everybody else, we're all unified in God. This would be something which would mean that when you're a pantheist, you're not just saying that God is, God is the universe, because if you said that, why not just talk about the universe? Why talk about God? Mm you have this unity factor. There can also be in the idea that there's a goodness factor. The universe is essentially a good place. And there can be the view that the universe is eternal. In many of the thoughts of Hindus and uh, in Muslim thought, 
God is the universe, and the universe is, is an eternal universe. So that's how you can add more to the idea of God than just saying God is the universe. Mm. How, how do you view the totality of these alternative ways of thinking from a Western perspective? Because we're so used to the Judeo-Christian monotheistic with the kinds of characteristics that we, that we uh, impute to this personal God. Uh, how, how do you look upon the totality of these other, um, these other concepts in, in juxtaposition to the traditional way? Well, I'm not myself quite sure that you can make this juxtaposition because there's such a wide variety of ways of thinking inside the Western tradition, and many of them are very hard to distinguish from the ones you find in, in the Eastern traditions. Mm. You say Western tradition has a personal God, but then I point to Aquinas, and I say, mm -hmm. in some sense, Aquinas' <laughs> right, God right, isn't right, a person. Right, right. Uh, you say, you, you didn't say it, but you could say, in the Western tradition, there's a fairly clear division between God and the universe. Yes, yes, yes. But in fact, mm. there are many Christian pantheists, and they publish books with titles such as In Whom We Live and Move and Have Our Being. Mm -hmm. You and I are then parts of God as they see it. And you actually find that in one or two prayers in the Anglican community. Mm. So when you talk of this juxtaposition, I, I say no, <laughs> there isn't one. No, it's not clear. The God which you typically get preached from pulpits will be the God who stands above the universe, created separately from the universe, is a definite person and so on. But when you go into the schools of theology, that all seems to, that's all up for grabs. <laughs> you can have it any way you want.